Hi everybody, Eric here, and in this video I'm going to talk about Arthur C. Clarke's Nine Billion Names of God, which is the first science fiction story that you'll be reading in this course. Before I get into this story particularly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of science fiction. Um, this story was written in 1953, which may seem like a long time ago, and, you know, in the genre of sci-fi, a lot has happened since 1953. Science fiction is tied to technology and technological development, scientific developments. And so as those things change in our greater understanding of the universe and the world around us blooms, science fiction responds to those things. As things go wrong in our ecology, in our economies, in our societies, we have new explanations for those things and new concerns. Science fiction also responds to those things. That is not to say that 1953 and Arthur C. Clarke is the foundation of science fiction. There was a period, the 40s and 50s and maybe a little bit into the 60s, that people call the golden age of science fiction. This is when uh, Isaac Asimov got his start and Robert Heinlein, Ray Bradbury, um, and slightly before them was people like Joseph Campbell and uh, Albert Bester. They were during the mid 20th century, and they were largely the people who created the version of science fiction that we're most familiar with today. However, science fiction is older than that. In the 19th century, in the 1800s, there were science fiction writers. And of course, the most famous science fiction story of that period was Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. That is absolutely a science fiction story. It asks how uh, a scientist could learn to bring a deceased person back to life. It relies on technological advancements to explain how uh, the scientist does it, Dr. Frankenstein. There's also the story The Birthmark by Nathaniel Hawthorne, which again has a scientist, has a laboratory, and this person is obsessed over his, uh, his lover's beauty, except she has this one birthmark and he just wants to get rid of it so she'll be 100% perfect. And it's almost like proto-plastic surgery. Um, but of course, in the story, things don't go well. And so uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, always a moralist, was trying to teach us a lesson. You know, we're also familiar with Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, The Time Machine, um, H.G. Wells. There were science fiction writers around the turn of the century. And so I don't mean to imply that Arthur C. Clarke's story here is really the foundation of science fiction. Science fiction had been around for a hundred years before he wrote this story. But as I'm saying, for our purposes, it is uh, modern science fiction. And so we start here. If you're interested in the earlier works, then I would say they're totally worth exploring. This story was published in 1953, and that's only eight years after the end of the Second World War. It's, after, it's eight years after the United States dropped nuclear bombs on Japan. The bombs on Japan are one of the most important events in our recent history. Uh, it changed how we think about ourselves in relation to the world. Before we dropped the bombs, the world seemed like a place that was so much bigger than us that we were really incapable of fundamentally changing uh, how the world looked how society functioned. We could have great technological wars like World War I, um, but they were not necessarily an existential threat to, to everyone. You would have to send soldiers to a place and they would have to fight and there would have to be a battle. After uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, all you needed to do was fly a plane over some geographic location and you could end all human life uh, for thousands, millions of people. And that was only two two instances of bombing, two bombs. During the mid-20th century, of course, these bombs got much, much bigger. You can read about the experiments at Bikini Atoll by the United States government. There was the Tsar bomb by the Russian government, or Soviet government, I should say, not Russians at the time. They were the USSR. So if we're thinking about this story coming soon after those events, it might give us a lens or a way into thinking about it. The obvious conflict in Nine Billion Names of God is science and religion, which is often portrayed as something that is an age-old struggle. It is absolutely not an age-old struggle. For a long time, in the 1700s, the 1800s, and even into today, there are scientists who are profoundly religious people. They're people of faith. 
and they don't see a contradiction between science and religion. They see science as a way of revealing things about God's creation. However, in our popular culture, science and religion are often pitted against one another. Religious people don't want Darwin and evolution taught in school, right? That's probably our most well-known argument between science and religion. So in this story, when we see some uh, not very accurately portrayed monks in Tibet renting a supercomputer from some engineers in New York, and then the engineers have to go to the lamasery, the monastery, to help them with the computer, we are tempted to see this story as a story about how science and religion interact with each other. I'm not saying that that is wrong, and if that's a topic you would like to discuss in your post for the week, I'd be very interested to read about that. What is Clark saying about the relationship between science and religion? Are they mutually exclusive? Do they overlap? What does he want us to think? The other thing I would like us to think about with this story, though, is here we have a scientific and technological advancement, the supercomputer, that's being given to monks. In our real world, you know, you all have a cell phone, I have a smartphone, actually I'm recording this video on my smartphone. These things were developed by scientists and engineers, but yet they're used by everyday people like us. When we think about companies like Boeing and Raytheon, who develop incredible military technology, they are not the ones who control that military technology. The scientists and the engineers at Raytheon then sell that technology to not just the United States military, but other militaries that we are allied with around the world. So those military organizations have people that know how to functionally use the weapons that they've bought from Raytheon, but do they know the science? After World War II and after the bombs were dropped, some of the scientists who had participated in the Manhattan Project, which was the U.S. government investment in science and engineering research to create the uh, nuclear bombs, those scientists realized kind of what they had done, and they started an organization called the League of Atomic Scientists. The League of Atomic Scientists maintains a thing called the Doomsday Clock. You can find it on their website. The Doomsday Clock shows how close we are to nuclear destruction. The minute hand, it seems like the, the, the hour hand is always on, on midnight, and the minute hand gets closer and further from midnight, um, depending on how closely these science experts believe we are coming to uh, nuclear war or the threat of nuclear, nuclear war. In the 70s, the 60s, the 80s, during the Cold War, the nuclear weapons were something that really were a huge point of discussion in our society. And we've sort of drifted away from those worries because the USSR went away um, and our boogeyman fight with the USSR is in theory over, even though at the point that I am recording this video, uh, the Russian president is aligning a whole bunch of troops along the borders of Eastern Europe. And so we would have to question how, many, how much things have really changed. So when we think about the role of the scientist the role of the things that they create and the role of the, the user. You know, like I said, scientists and engineers created this smartphone. I'm using it to make a video for you. What if I was using this smartphone to make a video that was creating terrorist propaganda? What if I was using this smartphone to create a video to convince people not to get vaccinated against a disease? What if I was using this smartphone to make a video to convince you that human caused climate change is not real? I can use this phone without understanding any of the technology in it, and I can use it for whatever purpose it's capable of without understanding those things. So you can either think of Nine Billion Names of God as a story that thinks about the relationship between science and religion, or you can think about it as a story that thinks about the relationship between scientists, the things they create, and the people who use the things that they create. I really look forward to reading what you think of this story, reading your thoughts on the story, and uh, I hope you enjoy it.